Welcome back to Decouple Studios. I'm Jesse Freeston, and today we are reviewing Meltdown's Three Mile Island. Netflix's new four part docuseries on the action at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in 1979. Globally, it's history's third largest accident at a nuclear power plant. And as a documentary filmmaker myself with a teensy obsession with energy, I'm pretty pumped to get into this. I love my cinema, 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 cinema. We'll start with a little recap of what happens in Meltdown Three Mile Island. Basically, the film tells the story of three particularly tense moments during the accident as seen primarily through the residents of Middletown, Pennsylvania. It begins with the original accident on March 28th, 1979, when a cool valve failed to close. While the indicator light in the control room told the humans there that it was closed, that led to a series of bad decisions, eventually ending up in the reactor core overheating, and eventually to the world's first significant meltdown in a nuclear power plant. That said, the containment of the reactor did not fail, which leads us to our second moment a few hours later when a hydrogen bubble was detected inside the reactor, and that led some to fear that it might lead to a massive explosion when it did not, we get to our third moment, which is actually during the cleanup over a year later. The company in charge of the cleanup, Bechtel, refused to run some very expensive tests on the special crane used to lift the lid off the reactor so they could get in there and clean it up. The whole second half of the series is dedicated to the dramatic testimony of whistleblower Rick Parks, a Bechtel employee who went public in an attempt to stop the company from using the crane and he faced some pretty devastating consequences for his efforts. Director Keith Davidson says his intention here was to create a ticking time bomb feeling around these three moments, and to achieve that, he used a variety of tools, including some very unnerving camera movements in the reenactments, as well as suspenseful music, literally from beginning to end, and interviewees repeating kind of over and over again in different words exactly how terrified they were. I was scared. It's extremely frightening because there was no place in central Pennsylvania that was safe. Are we ever going to be able to come back? Is my house still going to be here? You can lose everything. I cannot see radiation. I cannot smell radiation. I look around one day and I am dead. This relentless combination of stressful music and harrowing one-liners makes Meltdown feel at times like a three-hour trailer. All these tools are fair game in documentary though, and I'm sure it actually helped us understand quite a bit the fear that the Middletown residents were living at the time of the accident, but what it ultimately relies on for its effectiveness, this approach, uh, what pretty much provides the tension to any story are the stakes. What are the risks? What's the worst thing that could happen? And here is where Meltdown violates repeatedly what I call the Kanye West rule of documentary filmmaking. And deception is the only felony. So where does Meltdown deceive us on the stakes? Well, basically at every turn, but we'll start with the big one. What happens to this plant? Does it blow up? It's like nuclear bombs. What does a meltdown really mean? the fear became greater. This is up there with one of the biggest questions people have about nuclear power plants. It's a huge blind spot in our collective understanding of them. And the film poses this question, yet never answers it. And the answer is no. There is no physical way a nuclear power plant can blow up like a nuclear weapon. The omission is made worse by the inclusion of nuclear weapons in the opening sequence. And then we had this ominous moment. And what's happening in your dreams? All of a sudden, it blew up. Speaking of blowing up, that's what we are trying to do here at Decouple. Today's growth strategy is to publish a video on YouTube trashing its competitor Netflix and hoping that the algorithm rewards us appropriately. Plan B, however, would be for you to melt your cursor into that subscribe button and make sure you get more of these evidence-based anecdotes to fear. So as I was saying, for a story to have tension, it needs stakes, and in this case, it's danger. And in order to create that danger, you can use any tool you want, except you do not deceive the audience. That is the only rule of documentary filmmaking. So much for obeying the rules. 
just minutes from hundreds of thousands of people dying, the entire area of central Pennsylvania being permanently contaminated by radiation. A meltdown that could take up Philadelphia, New York City, and Washington, D.C. The east coast of the United States might not be habitable indefinitely. We're on the verge of an apocalypse. <laughs> okay, so... There's plenty of debate amongst experts about what the worst case scenario was at Three Mile Island, but this scenario privileged multiple times in this film is exponentially worse than even the worst case scenarios entertained by the scientists. And in the film, it's provided to us by two lawyers, neither of which experts on nuclear safety. Here, Meltdown is repeating the sin of the China Syndrome, the hit Hollywood film about an accident at a nuclear plant that was released just 12 days before the Three Mile Island accident. Beyond the creepy timing, there are some eerie parallels between the fiction film and the real life accident at Three Mile Island. Both were caused by a malfunctioning valve, a situation made worse by bad decisions in the control room due in part to malfunctioning instruments, and both involve a whistleblower alleging the company is trying to intimidate him for calling out safety violations in order to increase profits. At this point, you might be thinking that the China Syndrome was written by an oracle of some kind, but the truth is, is that most of these problems had already happened at nuclear plants inside the United States. They just hadn't all happened at once or had these kinds of consequences. It's worth mentioning that many changes have been made both in the United States and globally since Three Mile Island that have made plants much safer. But no, this is the greatest evidence that the China Syndrome was written by an oracle. The opening credit sequence is a two minute long helicopter shot of Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas driving a white Ford Bronco down the LA freeway, a full 15 years before OJ Simpson. I'm waiting for someone to convince me that we don't live in a simulation. Fonda and Jack Lemmon both netted Oscar nominations for their acting, but the performance that everyone remembered was this line from an unidentified man in a suit. If the core is exposed, for whatever reason, the fuel heats beyond core heat tolerance in a matter of minutes, nothing can stop it. And it melts right down through the bottom of the plant, theoretically to China. But of course, as soon as it hits groundwater, it blasts into the atmosphere and sends out clouds of radioactivity. Render an area the size of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. Forget for a moment, if you can, the odds that they would use Pennsylvania, the home of Three Mile Island, as their unit of measurement for reference in a film based in Los Angeles. The main point here is that in a film that is otherwise quite accurate about life in a nuclear plant, the stakes laid out here, the consequences of a meltdown are plainly false, as was proven 12 days later with the meltdown at Three Mile Island. That said, this scene in the China Syndrome added to all kinds of other cultural baggage which created the apocalyptic despair in the air at Three Mile Island. And here is where the filmmakers of Meltdown really did have an interesting challenge in front of them. How do you carry forward all those emotions, all that fear, all that uncertainty of 43 years ago while also acknowledging all the things that we've learned since, including what actually happens when a reactor core melts? Unfortunately, the makers of Meltdown decided not to take on this challenge at all and decided just to reinforce, or perhaps even deepen, the fears that existed in 1979 as if they were still valid. Just imagine if somewhere in the film the following had appeared. After running more than 500 power reactors in 30 countries over seven decades, we now know that nuclear power causes 99.9% .9 less deaths per kilowatt hour than burning fossil fuels, and is comparable to wind and solar in terms of danger. This is a fact, and by omitting this kind of information, Meltdown both succeeds as a thriller and fails as a documentary. To further break down Meltdown, I called up Spencer Wirt, a physicist by training who dedicates himself to the history of science and wrote the book The Rise of Nuclear Fear, which tracks the cultural history of our relationship with the splitting of atoms. So tell me, Spencer, what did you think of Meltdown Three Mile Island? Okay, very professionally done. In fact, I can only stand listening to so much of this ominous music and tilted cameras and zooming in and so on. Word's biggest beef with Meltdown is the film ends with an apparent celebration of all the reactors that were cancelled following Three Mile Island. Word wishes that this text also mentioned what those reactors were replaced with. People started building lots of coal-fired plants 
So the consequence is about 10,000 premature deaths in the United States every year. Right, from the, from the air pollution. Not to mention, you know, the global warming impact. And the film never mentions that nuclear is low carbon or that it provides power all the time, unlike wind and solar, which only work when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. There's only two solutions to that. One is nuclear and the other is batteries. Nuclear is a proven technology. Batteries is not a proven technology. I also called up Alex Wellerstein, a historian of science with a particular focus on nuclear technology. Alex, you said you were a little dismayed that the film didn't put things in the context of the energy challenges that are before us today. Is that right? I sympathize for these people who want safety. I also sympathize with these people who don't trust everything that the industry representatives say and also don't always trust everything that the government regulatory people say. I get all that. I feel that. But in a world where you do have to choose between what types of options you go with, you know, nuclear is this like potential potential hazard that if you run it poorly, make poor regulatory decisions, make poor design decisions, you could have these potential consequences down the line. Climate change stuff and fossil fuels, it's not a potential. We know what's going to happen. You're locking in the future. You're locking in catastrophic consequences. You're locking in immense expenses. You're locking in deaths. You're locking in cancers. You're locking all of that stuff in. Another key responsibility of a documentary filmmaker is character selection. And that goes double for a film like Meltdown, which doesn't use any narration or text to tell the story. As such, the story is in large part determined by those who are chosen to tell it. And Meltdown features some pretty compelling characters. But in a film that could help determine the future of nuclear power, we get the following breakdown of positions. To start off, we have our two local residents, and they've got great arcs to their story. They start off as people who don't know much about nuclear power and are generally trusting of the government, which is fascinating here, which means that their trust in the US government survived Watergate, the Vietnam War, the Pentagon Papers, multiple rivers catching fire. I mean, the Cuyahoga caught fire 13 times. Is the river on fire again? Oh, okay. And none of that shook their trust in the government until this moment. Add to that the fact that as they were kind of high profile activists at the time, means the filmmakers have lots of archival footage of them, which is super helpful when trying to put together a film like this. We add to that an additional local activist uh, determined to stop nuclear power. Then we've got the legal team. Both of them are clearly against nuclear power. The woman who was a young girl at the time of the accident, we actually never do get her position on it. But our hero whistleblower, Rick Parks, who in total loses his job, loses the love of his life, and loses contact with his beloved stepdaughter, all as a result of standing up to the nuclear industry, is still pro-nuclear. But we never hear why. In an interview with The Guardian, the director of the film says, a lot of the characters we interviewed for this, like Rick Parks, really believe that to solve our energy crisis, nuclear has to be in the mix. But again, that's never mentioned in the film. Essentially, the only person over three hours that appears speaking in favor of nuclear power is the evil government bureaucrat, who is basically accused of being in the pocket of the corporations, knowingly putting the public in danger, intimidating a whistleblower, and participating in a cover-up. He also never misses an opportunity to sound heartless. Like, literally, like a person without a heart. I don't have time for drama in my life, okay? An emotion, uh, I, I respect people's emotions. Ah, yes, one of your Earth emotions. It felt very set up as if the anti-nuclear people, they've got the real answers. They could tell you what was going on. And these NRC worms are the ones who are keeping you the knowledge from you and you shouldn't trust them at all. And they believe just the eggheads. And that I found problematic because, uh, you know, it's 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 a very anti expertise sort of argument. And I'm very wary of that, especially in our modern world, not just with nuclear stuff, but with covid. And we've had so much anti expertise that leads people to a assume that they can just sort of figure out all the facts on their own and that the experts don't know anything. So enter physicist Michio Kaku to help us separate fact from fiction. Kaku is a renowned popularizer of science, but his own work rests primarily in the world of theoretical physics and cosmology, stuff like string theory. And he also has a multi-decade history of advocating against nuclear power. One place in the film where sorely missing some expert guidance is around radiation. They throw around a lot of radiation number readings about milliram per hour and ram, and you're getting this much and that much. 
and they don't really contextualize those. Missing is any place where they show what's the number that we have where we can clearly show like associated cancers or something like that. It's much higher than those numbers. So nuclear radiation is literally everywhere. Right now, for example, I'm getting about 0.1 microsieverts per hour. That's about half the global average. The debate though is at which point it becomes something we should worry about. The US National Research Council identifies 100 millisieverts as a kind of key number here. That's for reference about a million times what I'm getting right now. And this is believed to be the point where things can start to get dangerous. The way they put it is if 100 people are given 100 millisieverts each, one of those 100 people will be expected to get a cancer they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. I know that's a bit of an awkward sounding sentence, but this is the language that health physicists use to accurately describe risk. So what do we see in the film? Well, the highest dose we see in the film is the one received by the chemist who goes to check on the boron levels in the reactor. His dosimeter shows him a level of 2.8 rem. That's the equivalent of 28 millisieverts definitely a scary number to see pop up in 1979 but today in 2022 we know that's about a quarter of what you would need to get to the level at which you could be expected to have a one percent chance of getting a cancer and that's for the guy working right next to the nuclear fuel as it's melting the highest dose believed to have been received outside the plant is about one millisievert that's a hundred times less than that key number we talked about and significantly less than a ct scan you would get at a hospital so what does the film's physicist have to say about all this? Anyone who says definitively how much radiation came out of that accident is either lying or a fool. So these kind of statements are tough because in some ways they're technically true in the sense that we don't have an unlimited number of Geiger counters out there recording all the time. But this kind of analysis amounts to another attack on expertise itself. Basically, Kaku here has an intuition that there must have been a massive release of radiation. The fact that none of the instruments detected that release means for Kaku that the people who are reporting what they detected and developing estimates as a result are either liars or fools. To its credit, the film does give a short nod to the majority opinion among people who study Three Mile Island in the words of the plant's radiation safety supervisor. The nuclear industry missed out on the best opportunity for public relations. Being able to say the worst thing that could possibly happen did. And nobody exceeded radiation exposure that could cause any type of biological effect. This take is buried in the 10 minutes that follows by claims that the accident led to a rash of cancers in the area, personally afflicting many of the people we've come to know through the previous three hours of the film. This pivot towards cancer in the last episode of the series is the film's last attempt at finding stakes. What were the risks involved here at Three Mile Island? And here they do give voice to somebody to point out the flaw in their approach. The problem is, is that voice is of our fearless government villain who true to form manages to say something that is exactly right, but manages to say it in exactly the wrong way. Can you find some isolated person who will tell you a story that's probably not scientifically legitimate? Sure, you can. You can probably find them and you can make a wonderful show that scares people and maybe you'll get good ratings, but it's garbage. This section of the film is very tough to watch and for more than a moment, it caused me to question all the interviews I've done and all the reports I've read telling me that the accident at Three Mile Island did not lead to a rise in cancers in the area. But it was Dr. Geraldine Thomas who reminded me that a full 40% of Americans will be diagnosed with cancer at one point or another in their lives. And then you've got the studies. They've done many, many longitudinal surveys of the people who lived around the plant. They started doing them in the 80s, they've done them in the 90s, they've updated them in the 2000s. And they've essentially found that if there was any sort of health effect from Three Mile Island that was caused by the radiation, uh, they can't see it. It's too small to be sort of measurable about what you would expect. The film just ignores all those studies and puts the emphasis on an article that was written reinterpreting one of those studies. And 
makes it seem like the gold standard. The leading expert of cancer rates in the Three Mile Island community looked at the radiation levels in the direction the wind was blowing, which was up and down the Susquehanna River. And he found two to three times higher incidence of cancer in the area where the radiation was. The article on screen is by Dr. Stephen Wing. And I went and looked into that article along with some people that know a lot more about this stuff than I do. And the article does not say what the film claims it says. It says specifically that lung cancers were up to two times higher in that area. Now, even if the film is wrong about this, uh, double the rates of lung cancer is something very serious. So. I had to look into it. So I'm about to call up Dr. Evelyn Talbot of the University of Pittsburgh. She's a professor of epidemiology who carried out by far the largest and longest study of the health effects of Three Mile Island following 31,000 individuals. Do you have, do you have a sense of, about how two separate studies could arrive at, at such different conclusions? We had risk factors, AKA smoking history. Dr. Wing was not looking at individuals, he was looking at uh, uh, cancer rates in areas. And I'm not saying that's not important for hypothesis generation, but that's not good for hypothesis testing because you have 20 times the risk of dying of lung cancer if you smoke. So you, you have to adjust for that. And so tell us about your work and, uh, and what you found. So the 20 year follow up showed no consistent evidence that radioactivity had an overall impact on mortality of the residents, which should be reassuring. Talking with people like Dr. Talbot, I really got an appreciation for the complexity of studying something like cancer over such a period. In that context, it's worth mentioning that Dr. Talbot did find an uptick in adult leukemia and breast cancers, but others have pointed out that if those had been caused by radiation, then we would have seen upticks in other radiation exposure related cancers such as thyroid cancers. I could literally do an eight hour episode or 8,000 hour episode about all the studies and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, what we have here is the third largest accident in the history of nuclear power globally. And we have a debate over whether or not that caused any harm to the public whatsoever, with the majority of the evidence saying that it didn't. Worried, however, that higher quantities were As for the film itself, some last thoughts. A cinema wise, I thought it did a really great job on the reenactments, which typically is not documentary strong for it. They often suck. And story-wise, it reminds us of some of the consequences of unchecked greed and the need for oversight. It also fulfills the classical role of documentary in supporting and amplifying the work of whistleblowers like Rick Parks, who put everything on the line in defense of the public interest. And on that point, Meltdown gets a thumbs up. The tragic irony here is that a film which criticizes the profit motive in the nuclear industry cuts dozens of journalistic corners in service of its own profit motive. At every turn in the story, it privileges unwarranted fears over studied facts, whatever it takes to raise the stakes. When the real stakes out here are the threats represented by the continued burning of fossil fuels. And this is where Meltdown adds itself to the blacklist of films that deepen an unjustified distrust in the technology in nuclear that is arguably best suited to help liberate us from fossil fuels. Add to that that nuclear has both the smallest mining footprint and land footprint of any energy source and the deceitful way this film slings mud at it becomes upsetting. Imagine a three hour Netflix series about all the people that have died installing rooftop solar panels. It would be 100% true, would probably have some pretty gripping reenactments and would be widely criticized as propaganda of the fossil fuel industry. And that's for a technology in solar that hasn't shown itself capable of replacing fossil fuels at scale. We need films that question our intuitions where they fail us. In this case, that big dark honk of steel and concrete on the horizon definitely doesn't look safe and really doesn't look ecological, but the evidence says that it is. Kind of cool, actually. That's it for this episode of Decouple. I want to thank all the doctors and experts and scientists that I spoke to to prepare it and for helping me get through some of this thick data. Uh, special thanks for Spencer Word for the interview. Couldn't use more of it because the audio wasn't so good. That said, if you want to find out more about the history of nuclear science and how our culture has interpreted it, often wrongly, 
you should really check out Chris's interview with Spencer over on the Decouple podcast. Also, a shout out to Sam Walker, who was very helpful as well in this episode. Now go watch a good film.